Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Jeffrey. I am an alcoholic. Hi, Hi Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Morgan, for the introduction. Thank you, Maria, for asking me to share. Um, thank you, everybody, for showing up. Uh, ten minutes, huh? I think, you know, I don't really like to think about what I want to say because then I'll just spin into these, like, um, disasters in my head. So I'll just start with uh, the first step, which is uh, admitted that I was powerless over alcohol and that my life had become unmanageable. Uh, it took me it took me a lot of years to kind of come to terms with that, but... Uh, you know, working the steps and talking with my sponsor and kind of looking at my past, uh, it was pretty evident from very early on that I, I, I am uh, without doubt an alcoholic of a severe type. Uh, I'm glad somebody introduced themselves as an addict. You know, uh, I'm definitely dual diagnosed in that, if, if you could say that, as far as... Uh, you know, I was I was um, using some high-powered narcotics by the age of, of 15, 16, and, uh, and my addiction takes me to prisons and the streets. Um, I've lived, uh, you know, on the streets of Texas, where I'm from. I've lived on the streets of uh, Arizona. I've lived on the streets of California from San Diego all the way up to San Francisco. Um, I've, I've partake, part, partake. I have, uh, you know, been introduced into a lot of different types of scenarios and situations that are, um, you know, lethal and dubious and and, and dangerous and um, and I never really kind of I never really cared or, or like saw saw like the danger in it. It was all just like this weird morbid adventure and. Um, you know, I'd get picked up for whatever, and uh, I'd go in, and I'd do a little bit of time or something, and I'd get out, and, and like, uh, I would always just go right back to it. There was, there was warnings after warnings after warnings, and, um, and I never, I, I, it completely all just went right over my head. Um, I never, I never picked up on any of it, um, <clears throat> and then, you know, uh, Throughout that time, I wound up getting married. I wound up having two 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 children, and um, getting you know some some sort of sobriety, and that, you know, meaning I went through a program and I uh, I got out and I was doing AA, and kind of doing okay, and then I got like a good job, and then I moved, and then the beer after work looked good, and then I kind of had the one beer, and then. That just turned into, like, I can drink, and as long as I don't stay off that other stuff, you know, as long as I stay off the other stuff, everything will be all right. And um, I, I pulled that off for a good amount of years until um, I was back on that stuff, and then everything wasn't all right. Uh, but I had absolutely no defense towards, um, you know, toward, towards anything else. I had, I was still extremely selfish. I was still extremely um, a you know, I thought I masked my alcoholism and my selfishness by taking care of everybody else and bringing money to the table. And, and because I was doing that, all the stuff, all the other extracurricular stuff I was doing was okay. Um, and then so, you know, the first step, powerlessness, what happened was that uh, I, I, got, I got caught up. Well, I I got caught up into doing some other um, narcotic extracurricular activity and uh, and um, and I and I and I wa- I, I washed away I, I shot away my job my kids my 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 family you know my my marriage um, uh, I, I, I I continue to like do you know bad stuff to to the people I loved I um, and I wound up back on the streets, and then I wound up back in jail, and then I wound up back in the court with a couple of felonies, looking at doing some time. And um, and uh, you know, I 
I remember, I, so to kind of paint that picture is like, uh, I, I, I'm a criminal. I do burglaries and, and, I, and, I, and I'm a thief when, I, when I'm, you know, doing my game. And uh, I, I broke into this, this business and I stole whatever I stole. And I went back to my little campsite and, um, and, and, I, and I passed out because I'd been up for I don't know how many days. And, uh, and I woke up <coughs> flying across the camp, landing, and then having an SFPD like, like impale my spine with his knee. And, um, and, and that's kind of how I got brought into this journey that I'm on right now. <laughs> Um, thank you. And so, um, and so that was a wonderful, that was a wonderful wake up call. You know, at the moment I was like, oh man, it sucked. You know what I mean? But then I went to jail and they didn't let me out right away. Uh, so I was able to kind of sit in there and sober up and, and, and clear my mind. And, um, and then this is where I, I, I had been introduced to AA before numerous times in my life. And, and now I was at this crux in my life where I was like, okay, I can either I can either continue doing what I'm doing and go to prison and and, and forget about my family, or I can um, you know go back to AA and find uh, the answers in that. And so that's what I chose. And now, uh, so I'll, I'll fast forward you know through most of it, and I want to kind of jump into the third step because I have for the last five minutes, which is a. Uh, uh, oh, come on, Jeffrey, which is uh, mm -hmm. decided to turn my will and my life over to the power greater than myself. And, um, and so I find that right now in my life, I have a lot of that going on. So like I said, I, ha I have two kids. I have a 16-year-old daughter who is following my path. She, she just got released from her first jail stint. She's in her first 90-day <laughs> program. Um, and, and so she's, she's living down in Texas. And the, the, the thing is that after she completes her probation and finishes this program is that she's going to come up here um, because my mom is the one who's raising her right now. And, she, you know, she's, she's my kid, so I should be the one that's doing it. Uh, I'm not going to get into all that logistics, but um, it's a very scary thing because, I, I, you know what I mean? I'm still selfish and I'm thinking about, like, how, how is this going to impact me and this and that? And, um and the, and the root of it is that it, it's not really about me. It's about her and how can I provide for her the safest place for her to do whatever she's going to do. You know what I mean? I've learned that she's going to do that, right? And so it's it's all about, you know, it's all about giving it up to my higher power saying, look, I have no idea what this looks like. I have no idea what that path is. And I don't need to know. I just need to know that I need to continue to show up. I need to not get high or drunk. And I need to be here for her so that I can show her that there is a way of doing this. Um, and that's, that's kind of that mantra. Uh, and, it, you know, and so there, there's, there's other things. Like I, I'm, on, I'm thinking about changing jobs and going back into to the Carpenters Union. And, I'm, I'm, um, you know, I'm trying to go to Bali to see my first sponsor get married, which is fucking terrifying to me to leave the country and, like, save money. And, like, uh, so I've got all these things that, like, I have, like, if I look at it, as a whole, I'm like, there's absolutely no way that's going to ever happen. But uh, what I'm learning and, and what I want to share is that I don't have to look at the big picture. I just have to look at what I need to do today, which is always just to show up and to be nice and to be compassionate and to pray and ask for guidance and help and to believe that whatever it is out there that's bigger and bolder than me is going to carry me through. And, um, and I have to always remember that that carry through isn't going to always be what I want, but it's going to be, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be whatever it is. And my job is to be okay with that because I mean, what's the alternative is to get fucked up and I'm not going to do that anymore. Uh, I've proven that that is not the answer to any problems. Um, so I don't know how close I am to my last two minutes, but I, I think that sounds good. Um, so I am an alcoholic. I trust in my higher power and I thank you.
Hi, everybody. My name is Kelly. I'm an, alco- I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Kelly. I'm not drunk, just can't pronounce words. <laughs> um, thank you all for being here tonight and keeping me sober. Thank you for your share, Jeffrey. I love the third step. We'll see if I get to it. Uh, this is the longest share I've ever done, so we'll see how entertaining I can be. It's like the length of an hour-long TV show with no commercials. So if anybody wants to bust in and sell something, like, let me know. (laughs) Um, My sobriety date is August 18th, 2016. So I'm looking down the barrel of two years in the next couple of months. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. Very original. Um... (laughs) I started drinking probably around the age of 16, but I think that I was an alcoholic long before that. Um, As a baby and a toddler, I was totally addicted to my pacifier. And I remember vividly still to this day, being about three years old, my dentist had told my parents that I couldn't have my pacifier anymore. So finally, one day they threw away all my pacifiers and I distinctly remember like flipping our apartment as a three-year-old trying to figure out where the fuck they put all my pacifiers (laughs) and clearly traumatic enough for me to remember this still um, as an adult woman person. So I have always wanted all of everything that's available. I have never known when to stop. Um... You know, and it never, it never really felt like much of anything to me when I was younger. And I started drinking. I think I had my first like real drink at 16. I was in my cousin's wedding. We were in the limo. My mom had expressly told me, don't drink any champagne in the limo. And I was like, fuck you, mom. I'm so cool in my bridesmaid dress. I was not cool. Nobody's cool in a bridesmaid dress. (laughs) Um... (laughs) I think that they're ugly on purpose, but anyway, that's a whole thing I'm not going to get into right now. Um, (laughs) So that same cousin who gave me my first uh, drink, she would buy me booze if I asked her to for my friends. So I was like the person who could get the alcohol because I was not cool. I was not popular in high school. You know, a lot of the other kids, they were going out and they were drinking every weekend. There were a lot of really permissive parents um, in our high school who, you know, were like, oh, I'd rather that you drink at home, blah, 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 that whole thing. Um, I think the first time that I got in trouble because of drinking, I was hanging out with a friend of mine who was definitely more adventurous than me. Um, We all went to Catholic school, and I was not as promiscuous as I would have liked to be, but I liked to hang out with this girl because she was, and I figured eventually, uh, (laughs) something sexy would happen to me. Um, so we were hanging out with some of her friends and drinking like Boone's farm or something horrible. And, you know, something did happen, but we were, my other friend and I were supposed to be spending the night at a different friend's house. And so we got yelled at by our friend's mom, which is never fun. It's better to get yelled at by your own parents. Um, and then I got yelled at by my parents and, You know, it just felt like I was being punished for doing what everybody else was doing. And I wanted so badly to fit in. That was my whole thing. I was a smart kid, probably too smart for my own good. Um, You know, I had a vocabulary that was too big for my peers. They didn't like that. Um, I read all the time. I didn't play sports. I was, I think the word is a nerd. Um, (laughs) So I wanted so badly to be cool. And just to be normal, I felt so weird. I felt like I didn't fit in, and it looked effortless to me what so many of my peers were doing. Um, So, you know, I would go about, you know, trying to drink and smoke cigarettes in, like, the nerdiest ways possible. Um, And then, you know, eventually went into college and got into drinking there. And overall, I don't think that I drank too much more in college than most of my peers did. However, uh, something that had started for me at the age of 14 was my eating disorder, which has taken a lot of different forms. So I had a tendency to not eat and then drink a whole bunch. And that is how I ruined a preview performance of South Pacific that my college was putting on for everyone. (laughs) 
Uh, I don't have hardly any memories of that night, and I'm really grateful that I don't have any memories of that night. But that was an experience that scared me enough. I was still drunk into the next day, and as a theater student, uh, we were doing these, like, outdoor projects where we had to like climb trees and do all this physical shit. And I was just like hovering on the edge of vomiting the whole time that I was up in this tree. Um, so that freaked me out enough to take a break from drinking. And eventually I drank again, you know, it didn't occur to me to go to AA. Um, my attitude pretty much up until I came in, almost two years ago was at AAs for quitters and I'm not a quitter. Um, so, you know, I, I quit drinking, but you know, I was still smoking weed. I smoked weed a ton during college. Um, again, I just wanted to fit in. I just wanted to be cool. I wanted people to like me, um, but also be very intimidated by me. Very confusing. And while I was in college, I met the man that I eventually married, Um, he was a bit older than me. He had graduated from college like four years before and we clicked very quickly and were very, very serious about two weeks into the relationship. And, uh, some of you have lived this. Um, so I was able to sort of give him the college experience that he had missed out on. He was like a super loner and didn't have a ton of friends. Uh, his roommates called him Mr. X because he never talked. Um, and And so he, you know, hang out with me and my friends and we'd smoke weed. And to me, he was sort of my training for what adulthood was supposed to look like. Um, You know, he had a car and no roommates and he drank, you know, almost every day. So I learned a lot about adulthood and how people were quote unquote supposed to drink um, from him. But at the same time, we were definitely like super codependent, even though neither of us knew the word for that at the time. I think he still doesn't, but, um, you know, we just enabled each other in a lot of ways. We did a lot of, you know, growing together and opening up as well, but there were these behaviors, you know, he didn't smoke cigarettes before he started dating me and he still smokes to this day. Um, so at any rate, Uh, this all seemed perfectly normal to me because I come from a family of really big drinkers. Um, we're all German, Irish Catholic from Southwest Ohio and people just drink instead of having personalities. (laughs) And, you know, that was all I wanted. I had so much personality and I just stuck out like a sore thumb everywhere that I went. And it was this one thing that I felt like I could really relate to my family and the people around me was to get wasted. Cause you, then you had great stories about getting wasted that you could tell the next time you got wasted. Um, (laughs) so we got married uh, about a year after I graduated from college. So I was a baby. I was like 23 years old and we moved out here to the Bay area in 2009. Um, in part because you could get a medical marijuana card and we wanted to do that. Um, so we moved here and, you know, I, uh, I was thinking this week, I, you know, I don't even think it's because I was prepping for this, but just some really awful shit that I did. Um, you know, just, I, I, we had, my husband and I had an open relationship. You've probably seen these people on okay Cupid. Um, <laughs> But so, you know, we were married, but we were having sex with other people. And I was like hanging out with this guy who was like super skeezy. And he like totally like finger blasted me in front of a room full of people. And I'm still so fucking embarrassed about it. Like all of this shit happened. And at no point was the solution to like stop drinking. Um, Even though this shit only happened to me when I was wasted and out of control. Um, and you know, and I would, I would try to stop drinking to lose weight or things like that, but it was never just because I wanted to live a better life. I just really thought every adult was like this. A friend of mine who later got into AA was just, you know, I was saying, Oh my God, I was so hungover at work today. And he was like, Kelly, everybody's hungover at work every day. And again, yeah, I just wanted to fit in. I was like, Oh, well, thank God. If everybody's doing it, I'm doing it right. Okay, this is great. Um, 
And, you know, I mean, I drank every day and never really thought anything of it. I would get really, really drunk around my family because they're very conservative and I'm very liberal. And it was really the only way that I felt like I could cope with being around them. Um, but, you know, I had one of the worst drunks of my life around my three younger brothers who are my favorite people in the entire world. And I like browned out and I had to go back to one of them and be like, what did I say? Because I said something and they were all crying. And it turned out that I told them that I wished that our mom had aborted me. And that's hard. And it's hard that I said that to them. Um, because I'm still not great with unconditional love. Like, I don't get that. I don't understand. You know, why would you love me just because? Why would I love you just because? Um, you know, I still haven't figured it out. But that was painful. It was so painful. And, you know, to live with that, I just drank more. And that was in February of 2016. And then I had all of this stuff happen really rapidly for me. I went, uh, actually, my mom came to visit me. And I had a day where I was like, oh, I just won't eat. And then I'll get wasted. Um, and I think between my mom, my husband, and I, we drank like four bottles of wine. And I'm sure I drank two of those by myself. Um, and I wound up, I woke up in the night because I was throwing up red wine in bed and had to change the sheets quietly. So my mom wouldn't like realize what was happening. And, um, you know, I, I couldn't see that I was drinking so much and that like when they were around me, my family would drink that much. Um, I don't think they drink as much when I'm not around, and after that, about a month later, my husband's father was killed very suddenly in a bike accident. Um, he died about 30 minutes after he was struck. Um, and shortly before that, I had witnessed a domestic violence incident um, at a party that I was at in this, you know, kind of polyamory uh, open relationship community that I was part of. So all these things happened. Um I left a job that I'd been at for seven years, got a new job, and decided that it was time to end my marriage and date exclusively this guy that I had been kind of off and on with. Um, despite the fact that he was living with his parents in Florida, this still seemed a brilliant idea to me. <laughs> um, because there was also, there was this whole thing going on with my husband where he was wearing women's clothes sometimes. And I was just like, I don't know what's going on here. Um, but I knew that I couldn't deal with it. So uh, I broke up with my husband and we were still living together. Um, I started this new job and I was not eating any time that I am in a new place, um, sort of physically or emotionally. Uh, but particularly if I don't know where to get food, I just will stop eating. Like it's so uncomfortable to me to eat in front of people or, you know, just to figure out where to get food. Uh, my brain just shuts down. So I wasn't eating. I was drinking quite a bit. Um, I think I lost about 20 pounds in five weeks and I eventually had a complete nervous breakdown. Um, I do stand-up comedy, uh, is, is something that I do on the side. And I was on stage. Um, I was opening for probably one of my favorite touring comedians in the country. Um, I was up on stage. I got through my 10 minute set and the whole time the edges of my vision were going black and I thought I was going to pass out on stage in front of an entire audience of people. So I got through my set. I don't know how. Um, I've gone back and listened to the tape. You can't tell that I'm like about to pass out. But I got off stage and I went up to the manager and was like, I can't do the second show. Um, I had realized finally that week that all of my weird stuff around food was an eating disorder. Um, there was a night where I was 
home after the show and I was on my couch under a blanket, but I was shivering and the back of my neck hurt so badly. It was so tense. And I just finally had this aha moment of like, oh my God, this is, this is what beginning to starve feels like. And I'd been living there for so long. I couldn't understand what was happening, but I finally did. And, you know, it was terrible. They had to call in some guy to like fill in for me at the second show. And it was just one of the worst days of my life. And the following day I got home, I wound up staying with a friend near the club. I came home and I was so tired. I had barely slept. Um, you know, I got in some kind of argument with my husband and I don't remember what happened. I blacked out. Um, and I wasn't even drunk at that point. I just think it was anxiety, but I wound up in an ambulance and went to the hospital and, um, you know, I talked to the doctor. I was honest about how much I drank, uh, which I think was the first time that I had ever done that. Uh, I was always doing, you know, the mental subtraction to make sure they didn't know and talked about my eating disorder for the first time. So he referred me, uh, Kaiser has a adult eating and feeding disorder, uh, program. And also he referred me to CDRP downtown Oakland. Um, and it took me about a month from that point to get to CDRP. It was really a confusing time. Um, you know, I had just started a new job three weeks before that. This was not great. Um, you know, I, I had to go on disability. I had to get into an intensive outpatient program so I could be on disability. Um, and the whole thing was just really terrifying. And in the course of all this, I remembered, um, I had been bulimic in high school. And when I told my parents about it, instead of sending me to therapy, they sent me to Weight Watchers. And I was so angry, um, about that. And so I didn't talk to them for like, six months. Um, it was just so hard guys. And you know, this is why I usually talk about what it's like now when I share, because it's still so hard, you know, even with working the steps, <laughs> even with making your amends, it's just like, that was my life. And I think what's worse is like, I thought it was okay to be in that much pain all the time. So things started to get better. Um, I went to CDRP. I didn't feel completely convinced that I was an alcoholic until I think about my second week. All my classmates were kind of talking. I don't even think it was like, you know, like an official discussion. Cause you know, it's one of those things. It's like a support group. You have to go around and check in. And, um, I think everybody was just kind of shooting the shit and a bunch of them kept saying, Oh, you know, if I make it through this 90 days, I can have one drink. And in my mind, I was just like, well, why the fuck would you want to have just one drink? <laughs> and then, you know, all the light bulbs went off and I was like, Oh my God, I'm such an alcoholic. Um, so I was really fortunate that from that point forward, I was like, okay, I'm in the right place. I'm going to figure this out. Um, I was super anti AA originally, uh, being raised Catholic tends to make you real, uh, down on the idea of God or a higher power. Um, and I was so angry at God still at that point, you know, I was like, he knows what he did. I'm not messing with that guy. Um, but I was really fortunate. Uh, I, I got sober really at the late show because I lived very near to where the old central office was. And that was the latest meeting I could go to for my required one meeting a day. So I would procrastinate as long as possible and get there. Um, but there was just this one night where I was just sitting there waiting to get my card signed and I just felt love and, you know, that's kind of the thing I feel like I chase now coming to these meetings because it was just 
unconditional love. It just existed. It wasn't about earning it. It wasn't about deserving it. It just was a thing. And it didn't really care about me, which felt very freeing. Um, I've always been raised with this idea of a very micromanaging God who's like looking at every single thing that you do. Um, and this was just sort of chill, you know? And so that was a real turning point for me. And I was like, okay, if I can have a higher power, that's something like that. I think that this is going to work. Um, so I stuck with it at CDRP. I completed the whole program. Um, for me, once I got to two months, things got a lot easier. Um, those first 30 days are just awful. And the second 30 are not that great either. So if anybody here is in their first 90 days, more power to you. I'm so glad you're here. You're in the right place. Um, but every day it got a little bit easier and the obsession was lifted for me. I was really lucky that I was able to decide, um, that I wasn't going to do this anymore because I've seen people in and out of the rooms who just struggle so much with just the act of stopping. And I think one of the greatest blessings of my life has been the ability to recognize how destructive this was and just step back and just put it down. Um, I found a sponsor at CDRP. She had gone through the same program and we had a very similar haircut and I decided that was enough. <laughs> that was enough of her having what I wanted. Um, but she is great. She's still working with me to this day. Um, I made some really tremendous friends in that program. Some of them I'm still in contact with others, not, but they were extremely understaffed the summer that I was there. And so we all had to really kind of step up and be there for each other um, because the staff, unfortunately, was not able to really be there for us in the way that I think even they would have liked to have been. Um, and, you know, I started working the steps and a lot of things have changed since then just materially in my life. Um, I broke up with the bad idea Florida parent living boyfriend. Yes, that was a great decision. You are correct. Um, you know, that was another bottom for me, recognizing that I constantly seek out the love and approval of people who are really mean to me. I don't know exactly what that's about. Uh, I think a lot of us are like this where somehow it doesn't count if it's free. Um, if you don't cause somebody to sort of just change course and like you, uh, how do you know they really like you? Um, anyway, but you know, this was a person who just couldn't communicate the way that I needed him to. And I had discovered this whole new part of myself that was underneath all of the cigarettes and the booze and the drugs and all of the destructive eating disorder behaviors. And I needed to be with that person. And, uh, that was a really, really hard time for me. And that was probably the closest that I came to relapsing. I had a really hard time around that breakup, but I got through it um, and I didn't relapse. That eventually got better. That was super hard. Um, kind of around the same time that my, uh, I felt like I kind of came back online after that breakup my ex-husband did decide that he was going to transition to female um, and live her life as a woman. So she's now doing that, and we get along great now that I've broken up with this person that I uh, left her for. Um, her pronouns are still a little confusing, so bear with me on that. Um, but I'm really grateful that in sobriety, I was able to make amends to her and that was very difficult to do because there were all of these patterns of behavior that I had uh, picked up on, you know, in my time in the rooms and working the steps and recognizing the ways that we were very unhealthy together. And uh, we did do some therapy coming out of the marriage. So it wasn't like we hadn't discussed this stuff, but to really just lay it all out there and only take responsibility for what I did and not point the finger 
and say, you did this and you did that. And that's why I did that was huge. And it was really, really powerful. Um, and I feel very lucky that we are still as close as we are. Um, and you know, it's, it's been a really rocky ride for these past almost two years. Um, and so, you know, we are on good terms. Um, in that time I got a new job and I left that job and, you know, I won't say that my fear of financial security has completely left me, but it's much, much better. Um, I'm interviewing for full-time jobs again for the first time in a while and, it's really, really stressful, but at the same time, I think as I've gone through this process, each time it gets easier to turn it over <laughs> and to remember that I'm not in charge. And that's been so freeing. It always felt like before I had to make everything happen. And I still fall into that a lot. And, you know, it's great now that I have these tools that allow me to focus in and say, okay, what's the next right thing? don't look past the next 24 hours or some sometimes the next hour, the next minute. Um, and I feel like I'm finally able to acknowledge that like life is hard. Um, it never felt like I could acknowledge that before. And I'm very much from a button down family. They're not into emoting. Um, anytime you have a problem, it's like, what are you complaining about? Even though everybody is constantly complaining all the time. Um, I feel like I'm learning how to be optimistic, uh, not delusional, which I was doing great at before. Um, you know, I'm not super pessimistic. I don't have these outsized expectations for my life anymore. I'm learning how to stay right sized. I'm learning that this too shall pass applies to the good and the bad. Um, you know, things aren't going to be great forever. They're not going to be terrible forever. They're mostly going to be kind of meh. You know, we're all going to wake up. We're all going to eat and go to work and go to meetings and do all of our other stuff. And that's fine. And that's enough. Um, I'm learning that I don't have to achieve greatness to deserve to live um, and to deserve to have somebody care about me. Um, the thing that I was thinking about earlier today when I was sort of thinking about what to talk about, the thing that's been the most fascinating to me as I've been going on this journey, I remember when I was out there drinking and using, I was so afraid of dying all the time, even though everything I did was me just like running straight toward death and saying, you know, take me now, please. And I really didn't want to die. I was very, very afraid of it, but I needed all of these chemicals to like cope with that fear. And now I'm not afraid of it anymore. And I'm not running straight toward it either. And I think that things are related. I think it's only when we kind of accept what the human journey is that in part we're born to die. And that's what gives life meaning. Uh, there's another program that I'm in and they use that phrase frequently. The meaning of life is to give life meaning. Some days I find that very meaningful. Other days I find that very meaningless. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's not that big of a deal because it's not about me anymore. Um, I never felt like I was trying to play God, but I was doing it anyway. It just kind of happens, I think. And you know, there's, there's a little bit of, uh, I don't know. I feel like, you know, sometimes my higher power is kind of like, I told you so. Um, but probably not. I don't think, I don't think my higher power is that petty, hopefully. Um, but you know, there's just this element of, there's this element of, I can't believe it was a goddamn spiritual solution the whole time. Um, I spent so much of my life running away from all these things that terrified me and it was only in sort of facing them and looking them, you know, just square in the face that I have been able to come to something like peace and contentment and serenity. And it's just, um, 
it's strange because I still, you know, I still can't really talk to my family. But in sobriety, I'm able to really look at my relationships with them and recognize, oh, you know, I had this narrative that I was the same as my family until some point and everything changed. But looking back now, I'm like, oh, I was just always different. Um, and, you know, I made some choices with how to deal with that that weren't super healthy. But that acceptance has been huge for me also. And just saying, oh, you know, I never did quite fit in and they love me anyway, which I still don't understand. Um, eventually, I'm hoping to have a better understanding of love. But I do think I at the very least now can look at things that aren't healthy that I probably would have two years ago said, oh, that's love. At least now I can look at it and be like, that's not love. That's unhealthy. And I don't need to subject myself to something unhealthy, you know, to prove a point, um, which is how I feel like most of my relationships would go. Um, you know, I hate to be wrong. And I think that's why it's such a tremendous act of humility for all of us to come in here because when you walk into your first AA meeting, uh, some shit went wrong. You were wrong. You were deeply, deeply wrong. And now you're here with all these other wrong people, uh, to see what kind of life you can have. Um, and you know how you can how you can find a way to be functional again and make your peace with yourself and with others and it's not easy it's so hard just every day it's so hard so i hope everybody who's here is doing something nice for themselves today um it's again it's one of those things where i'm alternately very thrilled by some of the the clichés and very irritated by them on other days. Um, but you know, my sponsor always reminds me, you know, no matter how difficult a day is, no matter what mistakes I made, if I didn't drink, that's enough. And on some days that feels like just, Oh, like I'm glad I have that. And then on other days it's like, man, is my bar really that low now? Is that who I am? And yeah, it's who I am. And, uh, I don't know. I feel really proud of myself um, in a way that feels right-sized to have gotten this far. You know, there's still a lot of work. Um, I still got to wake up and be sober every day and be present in my life, which is super hard to do. Um, I just wanted to escape from everything for so long. The idea of just kind of standing still is crazy. <clears throat> And, um, yeah, I think that's about it. I think I may be ending a little early, but thank you all for letting me speak. I'm so glad that you're all here. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.